Good evening, everyone. It's about 7.01, and I'm calling this meeting of the Tualatin Valley Water District Board of Commissioners to order. First item, I believe, is reports by the Chief Executive Officer and Management Staff. Good evening, President Burke, members of the board. We will start the meeting this evening, as we always do, with the Safety Minute. And the Safety Minute this evening is by our CFO, Paul Matthews. Good evening, President Burke, Commissioners. Tonight I want to talk about frostbite, a winter safety hazard. First, the signs and symptoms of frostbite. Uh, redness or pain in any exposed skin. Skin area may be the first sign, so pay attention to that. White or gray-yellowish skin area. Skin that feels unusually firm or waxy. Or numbness. And it's important to remember that a victim is often unaware of frostbite because the frozen tissue is numb. What to do? Uh, get indoors immediately, seek medical attention, remove constrictive clothing or jewelry that might impair the circulation, place dry sterile gauze between the toes and fingers to absorb moisture and to keep them from sticking together, elevate the affected area to reduce pain and swelling, and for superficial frostbite, uh, you may place the affected area in warm water that is between 100 to 105 degrees until the tissue softens. So with that, have a pleasant and safe winter. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, a few updates for this evening. Uh, first of all, talking about cryptosporidium. During the past month, uh, Portland Water Bureau has continued to detect cryptosporidium in the Bull Run source water. Uh, detections started occurring uh, in this last run of detections uh, in late September and have now continued for about three months. Uh, the good news is, if there is any good news, is that the concentrations of cryptosporidium are very low. And at this point, Portland is not recommending any additional actions on the part of the general public. Also, yesterday we learned that the Water Bureau has announced that they've entered into a bilateral compliance agreement with the Oregon Health Authority that establishes an agreement between the state and the Water Bureau and the EPA, basically, that the city will move forward with a 10-year schedule to begin building and operating a filtration treatment plant uh, to remove cryptosporidium from Portland's bull run supply. Uh, the com compliance agreement also establishes the required ongoing efforts necessary for the city to ensure protection of public health until the filtration is completed, filtration facility is completed 10 years from now. And more information on this can be found at the TVWD and the Portland Water Bureau websites. Uh, on October 27th, uh, now almost two months ago, TBWD hosted a tabletop, tabletop training exercise with the Regional Water Providers Consortium. So it was held here in this room, and the exercise basically assumed a large earthquake that resulted in limited available water supplies. And the goal of this exercise was really intended to help water providers evaluate the possible use of interconnections between water systems to see if we could move water around from one source to another system that really wasn't usually using that source or moving water between one provider and another provider. Uh, part of that exercise was really testing the Regional Water Provider Consortium's intertie tool, which is essentially a set of maps that identifies where all of these interconnections between the regional water systems exist. It's a GIS-based tool that allowed the, the participants to engage in some active problem solving and really coordinate between the various jurisdictions. We had a total of 13 different water providers here in the room. Uh, there was a total of 43 staff that participated in this exercise. So as you might imagine, this room was actually really packed full. Um, the feedback from all of the participants was that it was a great exercise, um, it was a great training opportunity, and they truly appreciated the participation of GIS staff that hadn't participated in previous uh, exercises or planning events. Uh, they were also, the participants were quick to identify that there were some problems with the tool that it needed to be updated on a regular basis. And I would also add the participants were very appreciative of the fact that TVWD provided the facility that allowed that, allowed that exercise to move forward. 
Um, uh, additional topic, uh, I wanted to point out to the board that we just yesterday received word that the city of Wilsonville is scheduling a meeting with representatives of the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Company uh, for January 11th. And, and the goal of that meeting is to discuss some operational and planning issues associated with the Kinder Morgan Pipeline that crosses the Willamette River just upstream of the intake that we will be using in the future. Given the board's previous expressed interest in the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, I wanted to check with the board this evening and see if the board wanted to designate a representative uh, to attend that meeting along with us, uh, go down to Wilsonville and meet with Kinder Morgan folks. And so now would be a great opportunity if you wanted to designate somebody to go. You're not obligated to do it, but I just simply wanted to provide the opportunity since we're all gathered here this evening. What, what was the day again? Um, it is January 11th in the afternoon. I, I'd be willing to go. Okay. I will work with you, Commissioner Doan, uh, over the next week or so and pin down the logistical details. We're going to have other folks going, and so we could probably give you a ride down. Great. Thank you. May not be, give you a ride back, but uh, no, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kidding. <clears throat> um, uh, talking about the January work session now, uh, in looking at our plan for future meeting agendas, we've come to the conclusion that we really don't have specific agenda topics identified for the January work session. And so unless there's any objection from the board, uh, we will go ahead and cancel the work session that had been scheduled for January 2nd, and we'll just simply clear the calendar of that date. Okay? Yeah. We will move forward with that. Objects. Um, just a reminder that tomorrow is the TVWD annual holiday luncheon. Some of you probably noticed the flyers up and around. Um, the, the commissioners are certainly invited to attend. Uh, it is from 12 to 1 here in the, the boardroom, and so if you're able to make it, it would be great to see you and, and feel free to stop by. I'm also told it is the second annual uh, dessert cook-off, and so if you want to enter in a dessert, uh, come a little early and you can enter the friendly competition for the uh, most favorable dessert of uh, the group. So, um, sort of in the holiday spirit, also just a heads up that I will be gone next week, spending time with my family. Uh, Carrie Pack, our chief engineer, uh, is going to be here, and so she will be acting in capacity for the CEO next week. And, of course, I will be available by cell phone and uh, all other communication devices. So if something comes up, I'm readily available and, it, and will be in the area. And finally, this evening, uh, Paul Matthews will be presenting an extra special department report this evening. Paul, take it away. Well, thank you, Mr. Knudsen, uh, President Burke, Commissioners. Uh, tonight's kind of special for us. As, as our usual, this time of the year, we present our audit. We have our independent auditor here to do that tonight. We also typically uh, receive our Government Finance Officer Association Award for our CAFR. Uh, tonight, it's also our opportunity to be the department that presents the department report. We do that on a monthly basis. We also have Todd Burton here, who's the president of the Oregon Government Finance Officer Association. He would be the one to present our award. So we're going to incorporate that into our department report. And with that, Todd, will you please present uh, your report? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Paul, and good evening, President Burke and Commissioners. It is my pleasure as the current president of the Oregon Government Finance Officers Association to acknowledge the district's receipt of the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for its fiscal year 2016 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report or CAFR. I needed to practice that long sentence. Um, I'll start referring to it as the CAFR. Uh, and Paul asked me also to talk a little bit about the Oregon Government Finance Officers Association as well as the National Government Finance Officers Association, the staff's involvement and the value that we believe our participation within these two associations bring to the district. Later on in the agenda, you'll be hearing from the district auditors and CFO on the fiscal year 2017 uh, CAFR. 
Uh, just a quick uh, uh, outline of the presentation. Talk a little bit about the uh, Oregon Government Finance Officers Association, or OGFOA. The United States, uh, or the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada, or GFOA. A little bit about the award that we've received from that association. And then I'll turn the uh, uh, microphone back to Paul for some closing remarks. About GFOA, uh, who are we? We are really a state chapter of the National Association. We have fi about 550 members uh, statewide. Those include uh, finance professionals in all sorts of levels of local government throughout the state, school districts, uh, the state itself. And then we also have members that we call associate members. And those are individuals who work for banks, financial advisors, auditing firms, who uh, do business with uh, local government public finance uh, folks. Um, what do we do? Well, we're really about uh, encouraging professional growth uh, through uh, training and information sharing within our professional network. Uh, we, f we do that through several, um, through several avenues. One is we do a lot of training. We have a couple of uh, annual conferences each year. We also do some regional trainings where we go out to some more of the more remote areas of the state that are hard to, for their, their staff to travel and do training there. Uh, we do have a certification program through the Oregon Finance Officers, and then we do a lot of information sharing. We have a website. We have online forums that par people participate in topics of interest. Uh, we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support. We do mentoring. We promote internships for organizations that are willing to offer opportunities for young people to get involved with their organizations. Uh, we have a newsletter, several public, uh, some publications, and research projects. And most importantly, we part participate with the uh, GFOA. TVWD has a long history with OGFOA involvement. It's conference speakers and trainers serving on the board of directors, uh, serving on committees, including the Accounting Standards Committee, which is a very important committee that reviews um, proposed accounting uh, rules and, and regulations. We provide comments to the national, so, uh, national entities that, pr that provide that guidance. And we contribute to the public uh, con publications and research efforts. I need to let you know that you have a uh, past president in your midst with uh, Bernice Bagnell, who served as president of OGFOA in 2009 and 2010. And the association was very honored to award uh, Bernice an honorary life membership of OGFOA in 2013. Uh, I'm grateful to the board and management of the district to have the opportunity to also to serve on OGFOA, and, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to serve as president for this current year. About the GFOA, who are they? Well, they're a national and really international organization. We have affiliations in Canada, Europe, Asia, and Africa, over 19,000 members. Um, really do a lot of the same work that OGFOA does, but on a much larger scale to promote the professional management of financial resources for their members and to advance uh, strategies and policies to benefit the communities in which we serve and provide uh, individual development opportunities for their members. They also provide leadership and advocacy on key public finance issues, particularly at the federal level. That would not only include Congress and, and uh, finding out what's going on. For example, the tax reform had some implications for uh, public entities. But we also work with uh, the Securities Exchange Commission, the uh, municipal, uh, rules, uh, municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, and other agencies that really affect the, the work we do. So we have a very large uh, national presence in that area as well. Um, one of the most important things that the GFOA does is provide best practice guidance in the areas of accounting, financial reporting, budgeting, investing, cash management, and debt management. And we often consult those best practices as we're looking, for example, to um, uh, upgrade our banking services, hire a consultant, make sure that we uh, are complying with the best practices of our peers and of the professional network in which we are involved with. They provide training uh, nationally as well as regionally and through uh, a number of webinars. So there's uh, good training available for all levels of staff in the organization. They do an annual uh, update on accounting standards, which uh, we participate in every year. And they provide a lot of other kinds of information and guides for both not only professional staff and finance, but also elected officials who have um, responsibilities of the financial affairs of their organizations. And they have their award program. We participate in two. Uh, we participate in the Distinguished Budget Award presentation, and uh, I, we, applied our, we have applied for the current 2017-19 uh, biennium budget. I hope I'll be able to report the results of that uh, review very soon to Mark and Paul. 
And we also participate in the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, just a couple of highlights about that. Um, they really, the, 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 the criteria to receive this award goes way beyond the compliance with just providing generally a report that is in, in compliance with generally accepted accounting uh, uh, principles. And one of the most important pieces of the f comprehensive financial report is to provide uh, transparency and, do and full disclosure about the district's uh, fiscal affairs. And this will become extremely important when the district begins to issue debt for the Willamette Water Supply Program. Creditors, rating agencies, other stakeholders will be very interested in the disclosure that we provide in this document in order to give them the information they need to evaluate our debt, our credit worthiness, and our, and our ongoing management of our operations. Um, that also gives us the benefit of being compared to uh, peers nationally, and our CAFR is reviewed by uh, others all, uh, nationwide, and we often get a, a, a lot of feedback on to improve our, our report each year that we apply for the award. It has a 500-item checklist, and uh, I did this presentation for the city of um, Happy Valley not too long ago, and I found out that there are no less than 124 specific areas, if not appropriately presented in financial statements, could ca cause disqualification for the award. So it's not easy. We do, ha we do, a, do a lot of work to, to receive this. And it is important to note that even though we do receive this award every year, it is no small effort to prepare it. Uh, the, as the requirements for uh, financial reporting, for accounting standards, for disclosure uh, change frequently and become increasingly more complex. I think you'll hear a little bit about that this evening from our auditors and during their presentation. We are also in a select group of only 115 uh, Oregon jurisdictions that received the award in 2016. That's really less than percent, less than 10 percent statewide. Uh, there's a lot of small jurisdictions that, that don't participate in this. So I want to just acknowledge the district in receiving this award. Unless you have any questions, I'd be happy like to turn this back over to Paul Matthews. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I would just like to add a little small tidbit of, of just what I think is interesting information about the GFOA. There have been five GFOA presidents from the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. and that's really unusual. Some of them are people you know, Bonnie Kraft, Ken Rust, Tim Grew, Mark Gonzalez, and the former treasurer, Gary, whose last name escapes me, Brubaker. <laughs> Gary Brubaker, <laughs> former I state treasurer. I thought pretty interesting that no other state has had that many presidents from their state. Can you click one more there for me, Todd? The award that we do receive, uh, we've received in the past. We're not going to go through formal presentation, but I, I want to point out a couple things. To keep us on our toes, to keep us from becoming insular in the work that we do, it's really important for the finance group to participate in organizations like the OGFOA and also to apply for the, uh, the award. We get an evaluation from peers. It helps us improve. We get feedback on our CAFR each year. It gives us things to work on to make sure that we, we keep improving, a continuous cycle of improving our, our, uh, our processes. That in addition to the uh, assistance we get from our auditors, who also help us improve our processes, keeps us from becoming insular and losing focus on the financial disclosures we need to do. And this, as Todd indicated, is going to be ever more important as we uh, have to do enhanced disclosures for our future bond issues. So with that, it concludes the department report. Thank you. And if there are no questions, that concludes the CEO and management staff report for the evening. Anything else for Mark? Okay, very good. Next item on the agenda will be Commissioner Communications, reports of meetings attended, and topics to be raised, if any. Uh, I usually swing around one direction or the other, but this time I'll start. Uh, have tonight's board meeting. On the 12th, I met with our CEO and Vice uh, President Bernice Bagnell to have a breakfast meeting to set the agenda for tonight's meeting. And then on the 5th, I attended a TVWD workshop where we went over the audit report and IGA updates. So, Commissioner Bagnell. On the 16th of November, I attended the TVWD holiday auction, and I just <coughs> mentioned that because I'm so proud of a relatively small staff raising <coughs> over $6,000 to give to deserving charities. That's pretty terrific. On the 5th, I also attended the TVWD work session, heard an update on how the audit was going and how the IGAs were in process. On the 12th, I met with Richard and Mark for the agenda planning meeting and, of course, tonight's board meeting. 
Commissioner Schmidt. On the 15th, I also attended the work session, um, auditor communications and uh, the use of SDC fields, uh, fees, and IGA updates. <clears throat> On the 6th, I attended the uh, Water Providers Consortium in lieu of Commissioner Duggan, which wasn't available. And they are mostly updates and, and polishing the mission statement in tonight's meeting. Yeah. Commissioner Duggan. Yes. <clears throat> well, I had the work session, and on the, uh, the 13th, I got to see construction of the 66-inch pipeline on 124th. Uh, it was sort of a sight to behold. I uh, used to do this sort of thing for a living. And uh, if you were to go through a checklist of, of all the things that you should do for a pipeline, they were doing each and every one of them. I was pretty impressed. Uh, also, the size of the equipment that Kerr is using. Um, you know, I, my, my eyes were the wheel hub of the... Uh, uh, the off-road haulers. On the uh, 14th, I attended the Illinois Business Association where the sheriff reiterated the uh, uh, distracted driving issues of people using their cell phone in the car to the point that when my cell phone went off in the car today, I just ignored it, which was sort of the advice he gave us. There are, uh, uh, if you have three offenses in a 10-year period, there's jail time involved. So uh, they're taking this pretty darn seriously. And then tonight's meeting. Okay, Commissioner Duggan. I have a very quiet month to report. Um, on the 11th, I met with our CEO, Mark Knudsen, who uh, gave me an update of everything that happened while <coughs> I was away on vacation earlier in the month. And then tonight's meeting. Okay, very good. Any commissioner topics this month? Okay, that being the case, We'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment. I don't have any blue sheets here. I don't believe there is any public comment tonight for matters on the consent agenda or items that are not on the agenda. So uh, we will go to the next item, and I will begin by uh, calling a recess on the current meeting so we can go into contract board. And so uh, we'll go into recess, and now I will uh, open a public hearing acting as the local contract review board so that we may consider adopting resolution number 32-17 declaring an exemption from competitive bidding for the water treatment plant WTP 1.0 pro, uh, project and approve or excuse me project and approve the use of construction manager general contractor delivery method so I declare the hearing open and I guess we'll have a staff report first and, and so Dave Crasco will provide the staff report this evening thank you Mark Good evening, President Burke, commissioners. So as mentioned here, requesting the exemption from competitive bidding for the water treatment plant project. Got a little bit of a presentation to walk us through why we're doing that. Uh, so just a reminder of where the treatment plant is on our overall program. It's about, it's about a third of the way up along, kind of on the in between uh, Sherwood and Tualatin in unincorporated Washington County along the new 124th uh, Avenue Extension and um, Twalton Sherwood Road. The treatment plant site is a challenge. Uh, the overall site is shown here, the whole 95 acres. On the north side is a future industrial development, but there's a lot of geologic environmental features that we're going to be faced with in developing this parcel, including various drainage and wetlands in the area, shallow rock on the treatment plant site itself to contend with, a Kolk Pond, which is a geologic feature that dates back to the Missoula floods that needs to be preserved, as well as uh, forest lands that we're also trying to preserve as part of this overall development. This is a 3D image of our current conceptual design for the water treatment plant. And on the right hand or left hand side of this figure is a listing of some of the major features of the treatment plant that have to be, uh, have to be designed. It's a long list and that's, a fairly, that's actually an incomplete list, but it gives you an idea of the level of complexity of this particular part of the overall program. So the key project challenges uh, one of the main ones is supporting a successful land use process. This portion of land is going to be incorporated into the uh, city of Sherwood, and we'll have to go through a land use process with them. Um, we'll be needing the contractor's help in terms of optimizing rock removal with the design and construction of the water treatment plant in Blake Road. As I mentioned, the treatment plant site is on rock, 
And so we'll have to make a determin determination about how deep to set some of the basins and some of the facilities, because the deeper we set them, the more rock, rock that has to be removed, and that's expensive. But a smart contractor might have a good use for that rock, either in other elements of the project or in construction of Blake Road. Uh, coordinating with the future in northern industrial development, there's various agreements that we have with the parcel that's going to be sold to the north, and coordinating our activities with theirs will be very important in this project. Uh, various, this, this uh, current site is without utilities, so we'll have a lot of coordination with PGE, Clean Water Services, and other utilities to make the site functional. Uh, protective, protection of environmental resources, as I mentioned before, um, and integrating the whole system uh, with raw water facilities, transmission main, and storage. This is going to be one of the last parts of the overall program to be constructed, and we think it's going to be integral in terms of standing up the whole program in terms of coordinating with raw water, raw water facility, raw water pumping operations, to delivering water all the way up to the top of the hill at Cooper Mountain and down into the transmission system. So for determining the optimal way to deliver this project, the team evaluated uh, all the different options. And so certainly traditional delivery through design, bid, build, was compared to alternative delivery options con uh, shown here. Uh, construction manager, general contractor, progressive design build, and lump sum design build. Uh, as we've done before, we have a standard process we go through on the program in evaluating uh, delivery methods. The first workshop for this particular one was held in January 18, and for that workshop we had 18, um, 20 actually, participants, the representatives from TVWD, the City of Hillsboro, and, and program advisors to help kind of guide us through evaluating all of the options and coming down with a short list that was evaluated through follow-up work, and then finally through a second workshop evaluation on August 17. And that second workshop evaluation was really a pairwise comparison between a construction manager, general contractor, and progressive design build, comparing those two against each other, and then comparing those two individually against, against design bid build. We looked at traditional delivery pretty hard because we have schedule available uh, to do this through traditional design bid build. But um, we, wanted to, we wanted to make sure that, that, uh, that if we were going to go alternative, which is what we're recommending here, that we're actually going to reap benefits that were necessary for this particular project. So we gave it a pretty good hard look. The criteria we used are listed here, all seven of them. Owner control, that's our ability to control all elements of the project, both design and construction. Operations uh, integration in terms of accounting for operations input into the design and construction. Contractor input during design, cost risk allocation, safety, and schedule. In the end, um, we found CMGC, Construction Manager General Contractor, is the preferred approach for this project. The specific benefits for CMGC are greater de degree of owner control, and that's both over the designer as well as the contract. We select both on qualifications. We can, well, we can count qualifications then selection of both. Um, as I just got ahead of myself there, we're independent selection of, de of the design consultant and the contractor, and that's opposed to progressive design build, where in that particular um, delivery method, you're selecting both as a team, and so you can't select them independently on their individual qualifications. It's a common approach in the regional market. CMGC is used a lot in the area. Uh, it accommodates a land use schedule better than progressive design build. On this particular project, we're going to have to take the project to about a 60% level of design before we go through the land use process at the, at the city of Sherwood. And so the benefit of having a contractor in the room as we're developing that 60% is that we're able to get the contractor's input involved because after we go through land use, we don't want any significant changes to the overall design of the project. Because if we have any major changes, once the contractor does get on board, say like on a, on a typical design bid build project, we might have to go through the land use process again. So that was, one, that was found to be one of the key benefits here. Additional benefits are contractor participation throughout design, just being smartered through the design process. Uh, value engineering, basically we have uh, the actual contractor involved in making some of these decisions. And competitive open book construction pricing. Now as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, I'm asking for an exemption from competitive bidding, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to use competitive bidding through the, uh, through the execution of this project. In fact, we'll require our contractor to bid out a lot of the work to competitively. So we'll get competitive pricing on a lot of the work. And in fact, the, the work that the contractor will actually self-perform will have to be bid in the open market as well. So we will still have a lot of opportunity to get competitive pricing on the project. 
Uh, so this is uh, the Oregon Revised Statutes, legal language here that says, basically, in summary, we've, we've achieved what, what ORS 279C.335 requires us to do, which is for me to present this to the local contract review board to say that we, we, check, we essentially checked all the boxes in that statute to, to proceed with uh, um, selecting a contractor in something other than competitive bidding. Um, so all of these findings are, are addressed. Uh, we're ho having this, um, uh, this uh, 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 open meeting as, as required today, and this and notification of this open meeting was done 14 days prior on December 6, 2017. Um, our anticipated procurement schedule, when we're going to get this done, is we're also working to encourage uh, competition for this project. We're holding pre-consultant consultant, uh, 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 consultant pre-RFP meetings are being held now through January. In fact, we might even have some into February because we're not planning to release in the RFP for the design consultant until, uh, until early March. And similarly, for the CMGC contractor, we'll hold pre-RFP meetings with them, again, to drum up interest and to make sure that the, the right advertisement is out there in the, in the uh, contracting world. We'll be selecting our design consultant in Q3, third quarter of 2018. And uh, in, the third, in the fourth quarter of 2018, we'll be selecting our CMGC firm. And so with that, um, I'll close with this request to uh, adopt resolution 3217, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Mr. Kraska? No. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, that being the case, I will entertain a motion to adopt resolution number 3217, declaring an exemption from competitive bidding for the water treatment plant project and approve the use of construction manager general contractor delivery method. Yes. I so move. Hold on a moment. Oh. Well, this was a public hearing, and while earlier you noted that there was no one here to testify, it probably would be best if you at least put on the record that you called for testimony. Yes, that is no that is appeared. that is well taken. I don't think there is any public testimony uh, offered tonight. But if case I am wrong, does anyone wish to testify in favor of or against this measure? No. Oh, but thank you. Your point was well taken. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, um, I believe that Dick Schmidt moves that we approve resolution number 32-17. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Commissioner Bagnell seconds. Is there any additional discussion? Okay. That being the case, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, resolution number 32-17 is approved five to zero. I, uh, I recall one of the astronauts, I believe John Glenn, a reporter asked him what he felt, what it felt like taking off in the space shuttle, and he said, how would anybody feel sitting on a million parts that went to the lowest bidder? <laughs> you know, what I, what I like about this is that it is structured in such a way as to um, expedite the process of going forward with the project, but there is competitive building throughout yeah. as it takes place. So it's a little bit of the best of both worlds, and uh, apparently no one saw fit to testify against it tonight. So I think, uh, you know, that also is testament to um, saying that this is a good move. So does anyone else want to say anything? I just wanted to thank mm -hmm. Dave for uh, explaining the, the pros of this particular method and also the special care in how it's being developed to add that extra edge of competitive bidding for the the sub suppliers to the project and and yeah like Richard said we have kind of the best of both processes all wrapped up into one well thank you you know I, I feel like competitive bidding okay all right with that then I will close the public hearing and now I will reconvene our regular board session, which had stood in recess. And so the next item of business is the consent agenda. These items are considered to be routine and may be approved in one motion without separate discussion. Any board member may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. Any items requested to be removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion will be considered immediately after the board has approved those items which do not require discussion. Uh, there are several items on the consent agenda tonight. Approve the November 15th, 
2017 regular meeting minutes, approve the December 5th, 2017 work session minutes, adopt resolution number 33-17, establishing regular monthly meeting dates of the Board of Commissioners for calendar year 2018, approve and authorize the Board President to execute the Fifth Amendment to the employment agreement between the District and the Chief Executive Officer, Adopt Resolution 3417, updating the list of capital projects eligible for funding with system development charge improvement fee revenue. And adopt Resolution number 3517, creating the list of public improvement projects required by ORS 279C.305-2 sub A. So that's a healthy consent agenda tonight. Uh, and so you're pleading the fifth? <laughs> yeah, I saw that too. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah. Um, no, I'm not pleading the fifth. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that item is on the consent agenda. So is everyone all right with the consent agenda? And if so, I'll entertain a motion to adopt it. I, I move adoption of the consent agenda. Commissioner Doan moves to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Commissioner Schmidt seconds. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, the consent agenda is adopted five to zero. <coughs> This takes us into the business agenda. The first item of the business agenda tonight is consider accepting the report of the independent auditor and the district's comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal years ended June 30th, 2017 and 2016. And CFO Paul Matthews will make the introductions and kick this item off. Thank you, Mr. Newsom. Good evening, President Burke, Commissioners. So tonight we have the report of independent auditors, uh, Julie Desmoni from Moss Adams is here along with Keith Simvik, who will be uh, presenting to you. They'll make their presentation, uh, answer any questions you might have, and at the end, I'll come back with a request to the board. So, Julie? Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. I'm here to present the audit results of the uh, July, no, June 30th, 2017 audit. Um, and a couple of things we wanted to let you know about during the course of the audit that happened this year. First, in your board packets, you should have received um, both the CAFR, uh, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and the letter to those charged with governance, which is our letter as the auditors to you as those charged with governance um, about the audit. So as we provided that in advance, um, I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, um, but did want to say that overall the audit went very well this year. Um, obviously, we, we did have one finding during the course of the audit, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, we do issue two audit opinions or two types of opinions during the course of the audit. The first is over the CAFR, um, and what we do is we take a look at your financial reporting to determine whether we believe the financial statements are, are fair in all material respects. You have received, once again, an unmodified opinion and an auditor speak, and I'm sorry, it's not everybody speak, but it's auditor speak. Uh, that is a clean opinion uh, to the financial statements. The second thing that we do during the course of the audit is under the Oregon minimum standards. So we're required to do additional tests under the state statutes um, that look at a variety of different contracting and different types of testing, um, including your budgeting, including your contracting, um, insurance requirements, and some other various requirements. And we're required to let the state know and let you know if there's any, any issues of noncompliance, which we did not find any issues with noncompliance in the current year. Now, on our letter to those charged with governance, when we kind of morph from the financial statements to the internal control system, um, though we don't provide you an opinion on internal controls, if we do find something during the course of the audit uh, that we are either concerned about or need to bring to your attention, we will do that through the course of that letter to those charged with governance. Um, now, I am very pleased to report um, that uh, the, I've, I've reviewed all the documents that you received in the last workshop. Um, I believe on the 5th, um, and the correction plan, so I'm not going to go that in detail, um, and it is so refreshing for a management team to actually bring this to a board before the auditors do, I have to say. Um, it, you know, what we found was a one-off experience. Um, it is something that had happened in the current year that hadn't happened in prior years. Um, we believe that management's corrective plan for the unbilled revenue and that calculation uh, is spot on. And I do know that there was a question that came up in the in the uh, regarding that corrective action plan. That's a new requirement by the state, in which if a material weakness or a significant deficiency is found by the external audit, that the um, the 
the entity go ahead and do the corrective action plan, and then six months later, um, we'll have to follow up with the state on that and the state auditor's office. So that is just a new requirement in the current year. But personally, I think it's it's a pretty great requirement because it really makes management think about what those uh, corrective actions are and put them in writing. Um, to be honest with you, we do not have any concern that this is going to occur in future years. I think that the corrective action plan is spot on as far as taking care of the issue. Um, and you know, moving forward, uh, we don't see any concerns in the future. So overall, uh, we want to thank uh, management, the accounting department. We probably ask for close to about thousands of pages, thousands of documents um, during the course of the audit. Bernice can 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 testify to that. Um, lots of information before we can even get out here, and we're pleased to report that management is in the accounting department is completely prepared for us when we come. I, I, I don't know why I say this, but it, it's like getting on a trampoline. Um, what we need to do at the start of the audit is to climb on the trampoline, and then we start jumping to see what happens. Um, and if we don't have that information prepared for us, the jumping doesn't actually occur. Um, and I'm pleased to report here uh, that information is, is prepared for us. Everybody's open and available to us. We have lots of questions. In fact, I will say when we did come in to talk about the final issue and how we class, did, you know, decided from an audit team to classify that as a material weakness, um, that's always an interesting conversation, um, and when, when we started to bring it up, um, Mr. Matthews already said, oh, I know this is a material weakness. We already have it taken care of, and here's my five pages of corrective action that's already taken <laughs> care of it. So very impressive um, from a management team standpoint, um, and very appreciated from an external audit standpoint. So took it very, very seriously. So overall, thank you to the entire team, and I'm available for any questions that you might have. Are there any questions? I'm just trying to get out of my mind the image of executives and trampolines. business suits bouncing up and down, flying through the air on the trampoline. I don't. I have kids. Sorry. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I, I, I like that. It's great. Uh, are there any questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. So with that, I'd like to thank Moss Adams for the work they've done too. And as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, this is part of our continuous improvement, and we get great feedback from auditors. They take their jobs very seriously, and it's very helpful for us. We get great return for the money and the time that we spend with them. So thank you to Julie and Keith and their team. And I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, Rena Byrne and Bob Shields, who are here tonight, mm -hmm. that did the work that resulted in the award that we mentioned earlier, as well as the excellent CAFR that we have uh, for you to consider tonight. So with that, I would ask that uh, the board consider accepting uh, the, the uh, CAFR and the, independent, uh, the report of the independent auditors. Thank you. You know, ratepayers don't know, unless they watch this on public access television, they don't know or have much contact with these sort of internal mechanisms, processes, procedures, checks, and so forth. But I think they make up the bedrock of the foundation, which allows us to project confidence to our ratepayers and for our ratepayers to have confidence in us. So uh, I would like to thank the staff and uh, the auditing firms we deal with uh, for the very good work they do that really uh, speaks to the heart of the stability and the strength of this district. So thank you very much. Anybody else have anything to say? Okay, with that, uh, I will um, entertain a motion to accept the report of the independent auditor and the district's comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal years ended June 30th, 2017 and 2016. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Bagnall. Second. Okay. Second. I'll, I'll give it to Jim Duggan this time. Jim Duggan uh, seconds. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Okay. The report is accepted. 5-0. Next item of business. Consider approving TVWD appointments to the Barney Reservoir Joint Ownership Commission and Joint Water Commission for calendar year 2018. So I will take the point for this particular item this evening. As you know, we are members in the Barney Joint Ownership Commission as well as the Joint Water Commission. We actually have representatives that serve on the boards for each of those commissions. We get one representative to the Barney Commission and three representatives to the Joint Water Commission. Those appointments typically fall on the calendar year basis, and so we have the opportunity to implement our 
our representative appointments to both con commissions as of the January meeting, which is the second week in January. So it seemed appropriate to just revisit who our commissioners would be as representatives to the two commissions. As outlined in your staff report, which is on tab 3B of your staff report, we have a series of recommendations for your consideration. I think it's all laid out in the staff report, but I will very quickly just review the staff recommendations that we've developed based on consultations with individual commissioners. So we would recommend to nominate Commissioner Doan as the Barney uh, Reservoir Joint Ownership Commission, uh, Vice Chair of the Barney Reservoir Joint Ownership Commission, nominate Commissioner Bagnell as the TVWD alternate to the Barney Commission, appoint Commissioners Schmidt, Doan, and Bagnell as the TVWD representatives to the JWC, nominate Commissioner Schmidt as the JWC chair, and it's a nomination because it's subject to confirmation by the entire Barney or uh, uh, Joint Water Commission. Also nominate Commissioner Doan as the JWC Vice Chair and nominate Commissioner Bagnall as the JWC Alternate. So a series of recommendations and with that, I would be happy to field any questions or comments by the board. Are there any questions or comments? No? Okay, very good. Uh, unless there is an objection, I think we can take this in one motion. Uh, is there any discussion? of this at all among the board? Okay. Um, go ahead. Well, with, with me at the top of the heap there, uh, Robert's Rules of Order is gonna roll over, over in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll have, a, we'll have a memorial service for uh, Robert's Rules of Order. <laughs> okay, so I wanna make sure that this is right. We're going to nominate Commissioner Doan as the BRJOC Vice Chair. Nominate Commissioner Bagnell as the TVWD alternate to the BRJOC. Appoint Commissioner Schmidt, Doan, and Bagnell as the TVWD representatives to the JWC. Nominate Commissioner Schmidt as the JWC chair. Nominate Commissioner Doan as a JWC vice chair. And nominate Commissioner Bagnell as a JWC alternate. Um, I will entertain a motion to make those appointments. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Duggan. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Schmidt. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Okay, the appointments are so made. Okay, the uh, last item of business tonight is to consider adopting resolution number 36-17, declaring public necessity to acquire permanent utility and temporary construction easements for pipeline section PLM 1.1 for the Willamette water supply system. Dave Kraska will give the staff report. Thank you, closer. So uh, PLM 1.1, it's our vernacular on the program, but it's always helpful to remember kind of where these things exist. PLM 1.1 is a subset of our PLM 1 project, which is the Wilson, also called the Wilsonville Area Pipeline Project down in Wilsonville. Zooming in there a little bit, we see that PLM 1.1 is the southernmost portion of this project. It actually begins at around Arrowhead Creek. It extends up to about Wilsonville Road. So some of the background on it, it's about 2,600 feet of our 66-inch line raw water transmission main. Uh, we're coordinating this project. It's design and construction with Wilsonville's project in that same area. They're, they have a significant roadway project for Fifth Avenue and Kinsman Road extension. Uh, it needs to, we found through our design process and in our coordination with Wilsonville that this project needs to be built outside of the new road right of way to avoid utility conflicts and also um, existing easements in the area and construction conflicts. And so accordingly, we need to acquire easements, uh, temporary construction easements and permanent easements on several parcels, seven actually. Uh, seven, seven parcels total, some of those uh, private, some public. Uh, this is just a graphic showing about where those are located for the temporary construction easements and the permanent easements as well. So this is a declaration of public necessity for this land. And we're in, accordingly, we're also um, implementing a multi-step process for acquiring land through the program. Uh, it begins with declaring this public necessity, and then upon declaration, we can then notify the, uh, the owners of the program's interest in the land and then begin by con then begin afterward conducting the appraisal, determining compensation for the owner, and proceeding with negoti negotiations with each of the owners for the land. 
And so with that background and that explanation, requesting um, adoption of resolution number 36-17. Be glad to answer any questions you might have. I move adoption of resolution 3617. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution number 3617, declaring public necessity to acquire permanent utility and temporary construction easements for pipeline section PLM 1.1 for the Willamette water supply system. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Okay, resolution number 3617 is adopted. And unless there is anything for the good of the order tonight, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everyone, and thank you. <laughs>